Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for standing by and welcome to Lufas Holding Limited fourth quarter 2021 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the management's prepared remarks, we will have a Q&A session. Please note this event is being recorded. Now, I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker host today, Mr. Yu Chen, the company's head of broad office and capital markets. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you, operator. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth quarter 2021 earnings conference call. Our quarterly financial and operating results were released by our Newswire services earlier today and are currently available online. Today, you will hear from our chairman, Mr. Ji Guangheng, who will start the call with some key achievements in 2021, address current capital market concerns, and finally share our outlook for 2022. Our co-CEO, Mr. Greg Gibb, will then provide a review of our progress and details of our development strategies in the quarter. Afterwards, our CFO, Mr. James Zheng, will offer a closer look into our financials before we open up the call for questions. In addition, Mr. Weiss Cho, our co-CEO, and Mr. David Choi, CFO of our retail credit facilitation business, will also be available during the question and answer session. Before we continue, I would like to refer you to our safe harbor statement in our earnings press release, which also applies to this call, as we will be making forward-looking statements. Please also note that we will discuss non-IFRS measures today, which are more thoroughly explained and reconciled to the most comparable measures reported under the International Financial Reporting Standards in our earnings release and filing with the SEC. With that, I'm now pleased to turn over the call to Mr. Ji, Chairman of Lufax. Thank you, everyone, for attending Lufax 2021 4th quarter earnings call. Today, I will share with you the main work of the main work of Lufax 2021, share the main issues of the current market, and share our view of the current market. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining our 4th quarter 2021 earnings conference call. I will start today's call with an update of our key achievements for the year then address current market concerns, and finally share our outlook for 2022. First, key achievements. 2021, we achieved steady growth, improved regulatory compliance and corporate governance, and strengthened our status as a role model for compliance and governance among overseas listed Chinese companies. 经营方面, 公司2021年全年收入同比增加26%,净利润同比增长26%。2021年全年每ADI收益人民币7.11元,为助力实现共同富裕目标,落实监管要求,陆控积极降费让利,综合利率按2021年 平均余额口径同比降低三个百分点，同时公司持续提升次担保比例，业务更加合规。our full year 2021 total income increased by 19%, net profit by 36%, and non average net profit by 29% when excluding the impact of non-core items. As a result, our basic earnings per ADS for 2021 reached 7.11 RMB. At the same time, we increased our share of credit risk, risk bearing while proactively reducing the all-in cost of our 2021 average outstanding loan balance by three percentage points, improving regulatory compliance and contributing to the national goal of common prosperity. In communicating with regulators, we had open and frequent dialogues through all available channels at all levels and achieved satisfactory results. Upholding our principle of preemptive diagnosis and swift operational adjustments for timely, optimal results, we maintained a proactive, candid, positive, and responsible stance in aligning the direction of our business with the trends of regulatory changes. Secondly, key investor concerns. 自上一次季报发布至今，公司管理层举办了五十余场业绩沟通会、NDR的等活动，与投资人保持了密集沟通。Since releasing our chief results, our management team had over 50 investor engagement events, including post earnings calls, Monday roadshows, and other meetings. 据统计，投资人问题中百分之六十六与业务相关，百分之二十四与宏观经济及监管趋势相关，其余涉及分红、回购。及香港上市等资本市场的安排，可以看出，随着监管政策的逐步明朗，市场关注点重回业务发展。经营的具体问题后续由Greg和Wise向大家详细介绍。我先就市场关心的宏观经济及监管趋势问题做一些报告。
based on our data, 66% of the investor questions were about business operations, 24% about, about macroeconomic and regulatory trends, and the remainder about capital market initiatives such as dividend payout, share buybacks, and Hong Kong listing. We're glad to see that investors are refocusing their attention back onto our core business as we gain more clarity on regulatory front. I will share our thoughts on macroeconomic and regulatory directions. Then Greg and YS will discuss our operational financial results. Updates on the April 29th ratification. 截至2021年底,公司已完成大部分需整改事项,剩余需长期跟进事项,例如冗余子孙公司的注销,存量互联网存款清零,征信断池链等都在有序推进中。通过各渠道信息,综合汇总,包括郭树清主席在3月2日国
uh, thirdly, the outlook for 2022。2022年的不确定性依然较大，受宏观经济增速放缓及新冠疫情局部反复的影响，中国市场整体信用风险有所上扬。好在公司提前准备四季度更加注重信贷质量，进一步加强信贷风控的标准。为应对上述挑
这些独特的优势，让我们在不断变化的环政策环境中平稳转型、稳健发展。未来，我们将坚持贯彻合规经营理念，践行有温度的金融，把陆控打造成海外上市公司合规治理典范，为投资人和社会创造更大的价值。Finally, I would like to reiterate our core competitive advantages born out of our exceptional business model. First, our business is fully in sync with China's national policy directive, directive of supporting the real economy, as we primarily serve small and macro business owners, mostly in wholesale trade, manufacturing, and retail industries. Second, we operate through guarantee licenses as well as our nationwide consumer finance license. Thirdly, we have attained unparalleled insight into regulatory trends through our closed dialogues with regulatory authorities. We have also accomplished thorough implementation of regulatory requirements by leveraging our domain expertise and financial DNA. The combination of these unique factors enables us to achieve business transformation and grow steadily and sustainably in a constantly evolving policy environment. Looking ahead, we will continue to uphold our commitment to maintaining full operational compliance, providing compassionate and inclusive financial services, setting ourselves as a role model for corporate governance among overseas listed Chinese companies, and generating growing value for our shareholders and our society. 接下来，请 Greg 介绍，呃，具体介绍一下公司的经营情况。With that, I'll turn the call over to Greg, who will share our business updates in detail. Uh, thank you, Chairman Ji. Uh, in 2021, we successfully and smoothly executed a series of operational adjustments to ensure the long-term sustainability of our growth and profitability. We reduced the average APR of our loan portfolio, increased self-risk bearing, and reduced our reliance on Ping'an Life Channel for sourcing. Our full-year revenue growth grew by 18.8 percent year over year. And net profit grew by 36.1% year over year, both exceeding guidance. In 2021, our retail credit facilitation business achieved a number of important milestones. First, we lowered our average loan portfolio pricing to 22.4% in the fourth quarter of 2021, from 25.7% in the same period of 2020, while maintaining overall unit economics. More details will be elaborated by James. Second, our business model is more in line to meet regulatory requirements. As Chairman Ji mentioned before, our guarantee company has set up locally approved subsidiaries in all of mainland China except Tibet, Ningxia, and Yunnan provinces, allowing us to operate our financial licenses locally. In terms of potential future license requirement, we have a consumer finance license, which enables us to leverage up to 10% or 10 times our capital, as opposed to a 5x leverage ratio that is currently contemplated for the proposed national micro lending license. Should any changes occur that give rise to a national or nationwide micro lending license, we have the required capital reserves, eligibility, and preparedness to initiate our application for such one, giving us even more flexibility in serving our core small business owner segments. Our current guarantee licenses allow us to share credit risk and process data flows with more than 65 national and local funding partners under existing regulatory frameworks. In addition, we are actively exploring new collaboration to meet expected credit rating license issues requirements, which come into effect by the mid of 2023. We are prepared to connect to a third-party credit scoring company by the end of June this year. Based on our latest understanding, the cost of that connection and the potential changes to our business model will not have any material impact. Third, we continue to increase our share of risk-bearing in line with regulatory guidelines. During the fourth quarter of 2021, excluding the consumer finance company, we bore risk on 20.8% of new loans facilitated, up from 10% in the same period of 2020. Our guarantee company that bears credit risk operates with a leverage ratio under two times. At the end of 2021, against the maximum leverage requirement of 10 times, our healthy leverage ratio, together with strong capital position, gives us comfort to meet any new capital requirements that may come from regulatory changes. Last but not least, we saw improvements in the direct sales productivity and operating costs that delivered steady, steady growth and net returns despite sharply reduced reliance on Ping'an. During the quarter, new loan sales from the Ping'an Life Channel continued to slow down, accounting for 24.6 percent of new loan sales during the fourth quarter. Down from 36.4 percent in the same period of 2021. To counter this, our direct sales team contributed more by improving productivity. Compared to the fourth quarter of 2020, our direct sales generated 21.6 more volume in new loan sales, but headcount only increased 8.4 percent and productivity rose 12.1 percent. This increased investment in O2O direct sales reaffirms our view that our offline to online service approach is the most effective way to increase coverage of this otherwise hard to reach. Small business owner segment. Our wealth management business is also making good progress in a transitioning market. In the fourth quarter, total client assets of 432 billion is overall flat, but grew 13% year over year when excluding P2P and online bank deposit products. Meanwhile, we also deepened our product reform to effectively shift our focus toward high-value clients and higher take-rate products. As of December 31, 2021. 
a contribution to total client assets from customers with investments of more than 300,000 RMB on our platform increased to 81% from 76% of the same period in 2020. Client assets from customers with investments over 1 million uh, RMB on the platform grew by 14% year over year, and these customers have a clear preference for higher take rate products. <clears throat> we have differentiated ourselves by demonstrating consistent growth in high value customers and higher take rate products, laying a solid foundation for future growth. As a result, our take rate in the fourth quarter was 64 basis points, increasing 19.9 basis points compared to the previous quarter. Driven by the optimization in product and investor mix, our wealth management business has improved economics. Going forward, we will further focus on uh, higher take rate products and new growth on upper middle class customers as we continue to develop additional value added services to bolster wealth management revenues. Now, <clears throat> let's take a look at future strategies. In the second half of 2021, the transformation of Ping On Life business led to more notable decline in the business velocity and credit quality of customers sourced through the life channel. The impact of this decline is seen in the change in our overall C to M3 flow-through rates, which deteriorated from 0.4% in Q3 to 0.5% in Q4. This deterioration deepened our resolve in Q4 to initiate change in our channel mix, further reducing reliance on the life channel and increasing the quality, productivity, and then the number of direct sales. In 2022, we will strengthen our direct sales channel by raising our recruiting standards, hiring more capable direct salespeople, <clears throat> providing them with more systematic training, equipping them with new technology, and overall helping them achieve greater productivity. Increasing contribution from direct sales will help sustain our new loan sales growth and should improve our overall loan portfolio quality as our direct sales force exerts higher control over the assessment of borrow creditworthiness than our referral channels. As a result of actions taken, we expect the C to M3 flow-through rate, uh, flow rate to peak in the first quarter and normalize in the second half, creating limited financial impact in the course of 2022. In the next few months, we will closely monitor new loan sales, channel mix, asset quality, and productivity of direct sales to track our progress and demonstrate our success <clears throat> in this transition. Finally, regarding our guidance, most of the impacts uh, from these channel adjustments will occur in the first half of 2022, resulting in slower profit growth in the first half, but accelerated new business and profit growth in the second half. Our guidance for 2022 is therefore more detailed to reflect the timing of planned adjustments and one-time items. <clears throat> we expect our new, new, new loan sales growth to be relatively flat to low single digit in Q1 and gradually picking up to three to six percent for the first half. An accelerated growth in new loan sales should be witnessed during the second half and we expect to grow new loan sales at nine to 12 percent for the whole year. We expect total income to grow eight to 10 percent for Q1, 10 to 12 percent for both the first half and the full year. Projected profit growth for the full year is 11 to 13%, with profit growth of negative two to 2% in Q1 and the first half. The slower profit growth in the first half reflects a number of year-over-year -year legacy related items in the first and second quarter, which suppress relative profit growth in the first half of 2022. If we remove the impact of these specific items, year-over-year -year net profit growth is expected to be six to 10% in Q1 and six to 9% in the first half, respectively. Lufax's management team has a track record of executing transformations uh, to ensure business sustainability uh, and profitability, and we believe this time is no different. By taking the short-term pain of making the channel transition in the first half, at a time we believe it is prudent to be prudent with overall growth, we will set strong foundations for steady, high-quality, long-term growth. I will now turn the call over to James Dunn, our CFO, to go through the detailed operating and financial performance and our guidance for the year. Thank you, Greg. I will now provide a closer look into our fourth quarter results. Please note that all numbers are in RMB terms and all comparisons are on a year over year basis, unless otherwise stated. We concluded the fourth quarter with a solid financial result, achieving consistent growth in both the top line and the bottom line. During the quarter, our total income was 15.8 billion, up 19.2% year over year, and our net profit increased by 1.7% to 2.9 billion year over year. Without considering the one-time asset impairment cost, our net profit is $3.4 billion, about 19.7% year-over-year growth. For the full year of 2021, our total income was $61.8 billion, up 18.8% year-over-year, and our net profit increased by 36.1% to $16.7 billion year-over-year. And the growth in both income and the net profit for the full year of 2021 exceeded the high end of our previously announced guidance range. Additionally, our net margin for the full year of 2021 improved to 37% from 24% last year. 
Let's have a closer look at our operating numbers. First, we further reduced our APR while maintaining stable retail credit facilitation business unit economics. Our loan balance APR was 32.4% in the fourth quarter of 2021, a 3.3 percentage point decline from 25.7% in the fourth quarter of 2020. In comparison, our loan balance take rate was 9% in the fourth quarter of 2021, only 0.1 percentage point decline from 9.1% in the fourth quarter of 2020. Our loan balance APR was 23.5% in the full year of 2021, a 3 percentage point decline from 26.5% in 2020, while our 2021 take rate only declined 0.2 percentage point to 9.6%. As we continue to diversify funding sources, engage with more banking partners, reduce credit insurance premiums on our loan portfolios, and improve customer charging mechanism, which lead to diminishing impact from the early loan repayments. We will continue to maintain stable unit economics and drive relentless improvements in our sales and operating efficiencies despite APR declines. Second, we maintain a stable growth in our overall loan volume and further penetrate it into core and targeted custom segments. On the retail credit side, we grew our new loan sales by 14.3% to 151.6 billion during the fourth quarter of 2021, in line with our business focus on risk management under the current macro conditions. At the same time, we continue focusing on serving small business owners. During the fourth quarter, excluding our consumer finance subsidiary, 79.6% of new loans facilitated were dispersed to small business owners, up from 74.4% in the same period of 2020. On the wealth management side, Despite the negative impact of P2P and online deposit products runoff, we managed to grow our total client assets to 432.7 billion as of December 31st, 2021. Third, we continue to execute our plans to evolve our risk sharing business while simultaneously maintaining asset quality. In line with prevailing regulatory requirements, we bore credit risks for 21% of the new loans we facilitated in the fourth quarter of 2021, up from 20% in the third quarter and 10% in the fourth quarter last year. As of December 31st, 2021, our outstanding balance of loans facilitated with guarantees from third-party credit enhancement partners accounted for 78.9% of the total outstanding balance of loans facilitated, down from 89.4% as of December 31st, 2020. All of the aforementioned operating metrics exclude those of our consumer finance subsidiary. Due to slowdown of macroeconomic growth, COVID-19 pandemic, and life channel changes, we saw some deterioration of overall asset quality. Thanks to our risk management system, the negative impact on our risk indicators are limited. Excluding consumer finance subsidiary, our DPD 30-day plus and the DPD 90 plus delinquency rates were 2.2%, and 1.2% for the total loans we facilitated as of December 31st, 2021, compared to 1.9% and 1.1% as of September 30th, 2021. We will remain vigilant and be prudent on our borrower's acquisition and risk management strategy. Fourth, we optimize our product mix to improve the take rate of our wealth management segment. During the quarter, our take rate for the segment increased by 19.9 bips to 64 bips from 44.1 bips in the previous quarter, primarily driven by our continued product mix optimization as we sharpened our focus on products with a higher take rate. Now let's take a closer look at our fourth quarter financial numbers. At the highest level, our total income in fourth quarter grew by 2.5 billion, or 19.2% year-over-year growth, while total expense increased by 2.4 billion, or 26.2% year-over-year growth, and then the net profit grew by 1.7% year-over-year to reach 2.9 billion. While operating-related costs continue to remain flat due to efficiencies, total expense increase is primarily driven by the credit impairment cost due to higher risk sharing and one-time asset impairment cost. Excluding one-time asset impairment cost, which was mainly due to the impairment loss of intangible assets related to Qianhai Asset Exchange and the Tianjin Guarantee Company, total net profit was $3.4 billion, reaching 
19.7% year-over-year increase. Next, let's go through financial numbers line by line. As the total income mix of our retail credit facilitation business continues to improve thanks to the evolution of our business and the risk-sharing model, total income increased by $2.5 billion or 19.2% year-over-year. During the quarter, while the platform service fees decreased by 10.4% to $8.8 billion, our net interest income grew 81.5% to $4.2 billion, and our guaranteed income grew by more than 538% to $1.6 billion. In addition, other income, which is directly linked to delivering services to our financial partners, increased to $769 million in the fourth quarter from $452 million in the same period of last year. As a result, our retail credit facilitation platform service fees as a percentage of total income decreased to 51% from 70% because consolidated trust plans provide lower funding costs. We continue to utilize them in our funding operations, enabling our net interest income as a percentage of total income to increase to 27% from 18% a year ago. Moreover, as we continue to bear more credit risk, we generated more guaranteed income, reaching 10% as a percentage of total income compared to 2% a year ago. By expanding our service to credit enhancement partners in account management, collections, and other value-added services, our other income as a percentage of total income increased to 5% from 3% a year ago. Our investment income decreased by 7% to $359 million in a quarter from $386 million in the same period of last year, mainly due to the fair value losses from investment assets. In terms of wealth management, our total platform transaction service fees increased by 23% to $708 million in the fourth quarter from $576 million in the same period of 2020. This increase was mainly driven by an increase in fees generated from our current products, which was partially offset by the runoff of legacy products. Turning to our expenses, in the fourth quarter, our total expenses grew by $2.4 billion, or 26.2% to $11.5 billion from $9.1 billion in the same period of 2020, primarily driven by increase of credit impairment costs and one-time asset impairment costs. Total expenses, excluding credit and asset impairment losses, financial costs, and other losses, increased by 4% to $8.3 billion in the fourth quarter of 2021, from $8 billion in the same period of 2020, remain almost the same as we further improved operating efficiencies. Our total sales marketing expenses, which include expenses for borrowers and invest acquisition, as well as general sales marketing expenses, decreased by 1% to $4.8 billion in the fourth quarter. Our general administrative expenses decreased by 1.5% to $971 million in the fourth quarter from $986 million in the same period of 2020. This decrease was mainly due to our expense control measures. Our operations and servicing expenses increased by 15.2% to $1.9 billion in the fourth quarter from $1.7 billion a year ago. This increase was primarily due to the increase in trust plans management expenses, resulting from the increase in the usage of consolidated trust plans and growth in the outstanding balance of loans facilitated. Our technology and analytics expense increased by 29.5% to $597 million in the fourth quarter of 2021 from $461 million in the same period of 2020 mainly due to our ongoing investments in technology research, development, and the lower base in fourth quarter of 2020 as a result of social security relief during the COVID-19 outbreak. Our credit impairment losses increased by 157.2% to $2.5 billion in the fourth quarter from $985 million a year ago. This was mainly due to the increase of provision and the indemnity loss driven by increased risk ex exposure as the risk sharing at the total balance level has increased from 6.3% to 16.6%. It is worth noting that we grew our guarantee income by 539%, a faster pace than expense, and continue to achieve positive profitability for our guarantee business. Included in the credit impairment losses, there is also a $216 million increase related to legacy products in wealth management business. Our finance costs decreased by 18% to $267 million in the fourth quarter from $326 million a year ago, mainly due to the decrease in the balance of convertible bonds following our C-Round convertible notes restructuring and the increase in interest income resulting from the increase in deposits. 
Additionally, our effective tax rate was 33.3% during the fourth quarter of 2021 versus 31.9% in the same period of 2020 due to one-time deferred tax asset impact. For the full year of 2021, our effective tax rate was 28.6% versus 31.5% in 2020. As a consequence of the affirmation factors, our net profit increased by 1.7% to 2.9 billion during the fourth quarter from 2.8 billion in the same quarter of 2020. Meanwhile, our basic and diluted earnings per ADS during the fourth quarter were 1.26 and 1.21 respectively. Our basic and diluted earnings per ADS during the year of 2021 were 7.11 and 6.69 respectively, represented a 27.2% and a 20.5% growth year over year. As of December 31st, 2021, we had a cash balance of 34.7 billion compared to 24.2 billion as of December 31st, 2020. Looking ahead, we expect an annual new loan sales growth to be at a 9 to 12 percent, but the growth will notably be much higher in the second half due to the completion of channel optimization initiatives. Similarly, we expect a total income growth of 10 to 12 percent throughout the year. Operating related costs will stay stable across the year with annual increase at about 6 to 8 percent. Credit related provision growth will even out in the second half given the increased risk sharing already started in the second half of 2021. As a result, we expect our total profit to grow at 11 to 13 percent for the whole year. Year-over-year growth will be similarly lower in the second half due to one-time legacy POP-related items in 2021. The profit growth rate will pick up in the second half once the channel optimization impact starts to come through, and the credit costs are all normalized on an annual basis. Next, let me give you some specific guidance for Q1, first half, and all year. For the full year of 2022, we expect new loans to grow by 9 to 12% year over year to the range of 706.8 billion to 726.2 billion, and wealth management assets to grow by 2 to 3% year over year to the range of 441.3 billion to 445.7 billion. We expect our total income to grow by 10 to 12 percent year over year to the range of 68 billion to 69.3 billion, and net profit to grow by 11 to 13 percent year over year to the range of 18.6 billion to 18.9 billion. For the first quarter of 2022, we expect new loans to grow by minus 2 to 2 percent year over year to the range of 169 million to 175.8 billion, and the wealth management client assets to grow by 2 to 3 percent year over year to the range of 429.6 billion to 433.8 billion. Since retail credit facilitation incomes is recognized over the life of a loan and is more driven by loan balance, we expect the total income to grow by 8 to 10 percent year over year to the range of 16.5 billion to 16.8 billion. In the first quarter, net profit will grow minus 2 to 2 percent year over year to the range of 4.9 billion to 5.1 billion. But if excluding the legacy P2P impact in 2021, net profit is expected to grow by 6 to 10 percent year over year. For the first half of 2022, we expect new loans to grow by 3 to 6 percent year over year to the range of 334.8 billion to 344.6 billion, and wealth management client assets to grow by 3 to 4 percent year over year to the range of 433.7 billion to 437.9 billion. We expect our total income to grow by 10 to 12 percent year over year to the range of 33.1 billion to 33.7 billion, and net profit to grow by 1 to 3 percent year over year to the range of 9.8 billion to 10 billion, and by 6 to 9 percent, excluding the legacy P2P impact in 2021. This forecast reflects our current and the preliminary views on the market and operational conditions, which are subject to change. This concludes our prepared remarks for today. Operator, we're now ready to take questions. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, if you'd like to ask a question, please press dial followed by one on your telephone keypad now. If you change your mind, please press dial followed by two to withdraw your question. When preparing to ask your question, please ensure your phone is unmuted locally. We have our first question from Richard Shu from Morgan Stanley. Richard, please go ahead. 
Sure. Uh, thank you, management, for the detailed explanations. Uh, I have a, you know, just a, some additional questions on the, um, uh, I guess, uh, reform of the direct marketing channels. Uh, could uh, management provide a little bit more details in terms of what's entailed? Uh, and then uh, but notice basically uh, in the past couple of years, uh, management trying to been uh, reducing the, um, I guess, the cost for the uh, direct marketing channels. Uh, will this uh, lead to rising costs, uh, cost income ratio uh, from the reform of the direct marketing channels? And for the insurance channels, any expectations uh, in terms of uh, the contribution from those channels in a, in a couple of years? Yep. Thank you. Uh, okay, let me let me answer the question and then Greg can supplement if I miss any. So let me first give you uh, the overall picture on the neuron sales trend by channel uh, if I talk about this reform. Uh, if you look at our total neuron sales growth ratio in 2021, uh, it was 14.8%, uh, 16.9% from direct sales, while live channel made negative 7% growth. And the fourth quarter, quarter on quarter, the total neuron grew by 14.3% in which direct sales they delivered 21.6% growth, uh, while large channel made negative 20% growth. And if I share a uh, general table number, uh, DS channel, they are still delivering two digit growth, uh, but large channel contribution, uh, their sales volume dropped, uh, I mean, uh, compared with the same period uh, in 2021, their sales volume uh, dropped by almost 40%, 40%, right? So as a result, the large channel contribution ratio to our new sales, it dropped from 36% in 2020, down to 29% uh, in 2021, and then down to 24% in fourth quarter last year. And uh, if I measure January Feb number, it already came down to 20%. It's quite a rapid decrease. And this is a result of our management decision. Uh, this is why we exactly intended, because uh, if you understand the difference of nephro, c 2 to nephro of BS channel and live channel uh, as of today, the live channel's credit quality, which is measured by NEFLO, uh, is almost 50% uh, higher than that of the access channel. So we have to control uh, and safeguard our portfolio quality. So going forward, I believe this 20% live channel contribution ratio uh, will be maintained uh, because we believe we took all the necessary actions by now to curve the rising risk of live channel. Then uh, going to our uh, access reform. Uh, so it's obvious that we have to increase sales volume from direct sales to cover the short from uh, live channel. Now here I want to emphasize, DS reform, what we mean by DS reform is not to fix an issue. Uh, DS channel standing alone is a good channel. As Greg said, fourth quarter last year, uh, DS channel sales volume growth rate was 21.6%, which was delivered by 8% headcount growth and then 12% uh, price for the growth. So DS channel is very strong now in terms of new sales uh, delivery and credit quality. So the uh, DS reform uh, we are doing now is to increase DS channel contribution in sales, sales uh, neuron sales volume. Uh, of course, we want to achieve this through per DS productivity increment rather than having more and more direct sales. Okay? So what we do is we call it uh, a new that we launched from our fourth quarter last year. So if we analyze our DS mix, uh, we find that uh, the group whose sales experience is more than three years before they join us and married and have reasonably, reasonably uh, indebted so they need to work hard for families. So those groups uh, used to take about less than 10% of our new hire, but it increased to 45% by January uh, uh, this year. Uh, for that, we put extra input. We increased the fixed salary to, to attract more uh, new tie, and then uh, gradually we changed fixed salary uh, to a variable, uh, variable uh, yeah, commission. Uh, then it's very obvious that as time will be six, uh, our analysis shows that this group of Yotai, they show obviously higher profitability than other group. And then if we have more and more Yotai group, eventually this will further reduce our sales expense because direct sales uh, expense components, one third uh, variable are uh, fixed, and then two third are uh, the uh, variable. So when we have more and more higher profitability uh, direct sales, it will eventually also decrease our direct sales uh, sales cost. And then once those group prove they can deliver higher productivity and the low delivery ratio. Then we want to uh, we want to change the role from simple sales force to customer relationship manager, so they can manage not only uh, sales but also uh, second loan, third loan sales, complaint handling, and early bucket delivery management. And eventually, we incentivize them uh, based on balance, current balance instead of uh, loan amount, new loan amount. And then, uh, if you if you see our trail record, I believe this task compared with what we achieved uh, in the last two years, for example. 
like uh, recovering from the pandemic impact ahead of other players, or uh, increasing sales yield portion from 1% to about 20% in cooperation with our 65 partner banks, five source companies, and keeping the net margin unchanged despite we sharply decreased our APR. Compared with those tasks, I think this is a relatively simple task that we have full confidence, then you can see that uh, how we deliver this. Richard, any follow-up question on that? Uh, that's pretty clear. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. We now have our next question from Hans Fan from CLSA. Hans, please go ahead. Thank you, Management, for giving me this opportunity to ask questions. I actually have two questions, uh, if I may. So the first one is actually on the take rate in fourth quarter. Uh, we note that the take rate was down uh, a lot of Q&Q to 9%. Uh, can you please elaborate on the drivers behind this? And also, if you look into the, this year in terms of take rate, how, how do we see the change there? That's the uh, first question. Um, and the second question is on the regulatory side. Uh, the, uh, just now, Chairman G mentioned, oh, sorry, Quack mentioned that the, uh, by end of June, uh, it's likely look like we'll finish uh, and, and connect to the third-party credit scoring companies. So just wondering, um, uh, how, how, how likely this is to happen? Is that 100% sure? Uh, have we uh, come out with uh, regulations on this yet? So because this, this is something really cared about by the market. So just wondering uh, how confident we are on this. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, thanks, Art. Let me ask, uh, let me answer your first question first. Um, about the take rate, uh, normally the fourth quarter uh, is the period we have the lowest take rate and margin. So uh, if you compare uh, year on year, 2020 and 2021, um, yeah, the balance-based UE actually uh, didn't change uh, at all. And then if you also uh, look at, uh, we'll share later, uh, if you look at our new business uh, UE, our net margin didn't change any, while our API dropped by from like a 20, almost 27% down to 23%, which is like a four uh, percentage point. Uh, so going forward, uh, this year, how do we see uh, the take rate and net margin trend? Uh, Greg said in his uh, speech, he said, uh, the old key lines, like the new on sales, the balance, revenue, and net profit, uh, he estimates uh, will increase by around 10%. So that will indicate, we believe, this year, our take rate net margin will not change much. Why? Number one, uh, about the price price uh, discussion. Uh, our average blended APR for new on now is around 20%, 20%. So we believe this will meet uh, level two requirement. And then we don't see any need to further reduce our APR for new ones. So price, uh, we think we can maintain the current level for new ones, while we can save uh, further expense from operational costs and the funding costs. But that can be offset by, uh, by uh, that uh, increasing credit cost in the first quarter, second quarter. So overall, so I believe this year, net margin will remain not much changes. And on the regulatory, uh, the, the Swanjulian uh, for June. Yeah, Swanjulian, uh, this uh, Swanjulian. So we are ready with a new process uh, working with Bai Hang. So that process uh, can be ready, fully ready by uh, June this year. But we haven't got clear signal, clear guidance from PBOC yet. Uh, we submitted our plan, uh, but we haven't got clear answer, so we are waiting. But even if we do that, uh, let me add just one more comment uh, regarding the cost. Uh, it will cost, it will, it will, it will, uh, it will cost us about uh, 300,000 or maybe a month. So cost-wise, is nothing. But I'm just telling you that process-wise, we are fully ready. And why? It's one of the reasons that the, the PBOC hasn't given us a clear answer yet is they're still also not sure, uh, in the sense that our guarantee license yes. is already we able to answer. Right? Guarantee uh, financial guarantee license company. Uh, they are not sure yet whether we have to follow this process. So we are waiting. Right, right. And also, I remember in last last time in third quarter uh, briefing, uh, the management mentioned that uh, there's also a uh, potential chance. Uh, we are seeking the possibility to see, uh, to apply for license of credit scoring company. Is that still on the table? Yeah, that's on the table. But um, I, huh? uh, you may know that 8% of their shares uh, is owned by uh, Ping Ping. Right? Mm -hmm. So uh, if, if any, we also have a stakeholder uh, in, in, that, in the company. And then uh, that, uh, our, uh, the plan that you mentioned, this still, uh, still, is still, still going on. Understood. Thank you very much. Next question, please. Thank you. We now have a question from 
Thomas Wan from Goldman Sachs. Thomas, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, it's a good set of numbers. Congrats on that. Uh, can I just check on the full year uh, 22 guidance? If, if I roughly uh, work on new loan numbers, uh, first half guidance, is only three to six, and the full year nine to twelve. So, so it roughly works out fifteen to twenty percent implied for the second half. Um, can I just sort of get your thought on if if you extend it a little bit further? Do you think this is kind of a sustainable type of new loan facilitation growth, or do you have you factoring in some sort of pent up demand in that number? Uh, we may see some even normalization going forward uh, in twenty twenty three. Just just get your thought on, on why you you think that so the second half number is in that in that range. Thank you. Okay, so I think the key here is um, the new sales. So if you remember the first quarter uh, guidance number, we believe new sales uh, will not make uh, obvious scores from the previous year. The biggest reason is, as I said, the large channel contribution, they, uh, their sales volume dropped almost by 40%, right? So even if uh, direct sales channel go by, by two digits, uh, it cannot offset enough the short from live channel uh, the, uh, decrease, sales volume decrease. So it will take some time, uh, but going forward, because we believe uh, the 20% sales contribution ratio from live channel, this will be maintained because we took all the necessary actions by now. So the rest going forward uh, will gradually increase over sales volume by developing more and more direct sales channels. So it takes time. So that will come, that will uh, happen from second quarter. And then from second half, you will see the obvious sales growth ratio uh, versus last year by more than two digits. So that will drive uh, our revenue and our net income growth in the second half. And so, you know, Thomas, if you take that, uh, you know, as far as we can tell, the contribution from Ping on Life this year will be about 20%. And, and that may be true for another year or two, right, depending on the, on the speed of the transition uh, at Ping on Life itself. And so if you take that into account, uh, rolling into 2023 with the reform on the DS side or the strengthening of the direct sales side, then to go back to a more, uh, you know, for a 15% level that you're seeing in the second half into 2023 is, is possible, right? So it is an adjustment in the first half of this year, which is slower, but as you look at the second half of the year, that is a good indication to where we think things are medium term. Got it. So, so if I take it, so basically, is, is the market still there? It's, it's not anything. You kind of adjusting your internal on the channel on your sales force, so that that's why we have this kind of a dip in the first half for 2022. Um, then, if I may have a follow up, so so the, obviously the right channel plays a bigger part in this growth uh, to drive growth. Uh, where, where are you hiring kind of those new um, direct sales personnel? And that, so the, what type of person you, you're hiring uh, and then how, how you're sort of, uh, training them? Yeah, uh, actually we are hiring uh, locally. So we have 25 local branches. Uh, they are hiring their own direct sales. And then we are specific targeting, uh, as I explained, uh, we call them your type. Uh, they have different profiles. If you analyze who's delivering higher sales volume, higher productivity, and low delivery ratio among our direct sales, almost 60,000 direct sales, that uh, we found that uh, in general, the who had sales experience more than three years before they joined us, and then who got married, and then there are several profile indicators. So we are uh, specifically targeting, uh, targeting to hire those groups. And then those groups, uh, they used to take less than 10% of our new hire last year, especially first half. And as of today, they take about 40%, more than 40% of new hire. So we are making a progress. And then how to hire them? Because uh, earlier, uh, the reason they didn't, uh, they didn't want to, or they hesitated to joining us, uh, was because uh, our fixed salary at the beginning was very, very low. So then we changed it. So we are offering higher fixed salary in the first six months. And then gradually, we switch the portion. We gradually reduce fixed part and increase variable bonus based on their performance. So this is a resolving higher issue. And then how we educate, how we train them. Uh, we have the uh, supplement. We developed the online training tool through our sales app. So through that, we provide a lot more efficient training than before. It's not offline. We provide by, for different uh, target group, different DS group, different profile. We provide different set of training through online uh, sales app. So I think that the, uh, the, the interesting thing here, uh, Thomas, to sort of just uh, hit your point, is that the, for the first half, this is to a certain extent self-imposed. Uh, because we want to make, maintain a sort of long-term credit quality uh, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a key criteria, um, and just recognizing that was necessary, a necessary change to make given uh, some of the transformations on the Ping-On uh, life side. I think that um, what YS has laid out, what becomes interesting over time when you move into maybe next year, is this Yotai group, this, this more uh, experienced, uh, more stable group of salespeople over time, 
the ability to deliver on a customer management model rather than a pure loan sales model is very powerful for our economics uh, and our productivity. And so that, at the end of the day, is what we're really trying to build. Uh, and then the work behind that as well is really on the technology side to give them the tools to drive that customer management in an efficient way. Uh, and so this is kind of a more medium-term transition that you should see come through. It's more about changing mix uh, in the first half of this year, but then it also involves changing a little bit of business model and how we serve customers as you go into the medium term. Got it. Thank you, Thomas. That's, that's right. Thank please you. Move to, uh, yeah, please move to the next and last question, please, Dr. Sure. We now have our last question from Mei Yin from UBS. Mei, please go ahead. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you for giving me this uh, chance to ask the last question. Uh, I, I actually have uh, three questions, if I may. Um, the first one is to uh,呃，提到这个监管的这个态度上哈，就是您刚才提到说，在这个整改呃这个咱们陆金所做的是最最好的啊。那么是不是说呃我们就有没有一个时间点上看什么时候可以就算是呃结束了？还有就是说呃如果
我觉得我们对跟对市场、跟对投资者整个沟通，我们都是谨慎的、严严谨的。我们到目前为止好像还没有吹过牛，没有说过过头话。所以这个呢，我觉得这是一个基本判断。第一，我们证明接近尾声了；第二，我们做的是做的好的之一。那么这个是信息，我们需要时间来判断。呃，需要我觉得呃会得到印证的。第二就是我会不会做得好的，给他先结束，或者就是我们过去先把他释放掉，释放掉，让他做可以做的做一个。我个人判断，我觉得这个不应该的，不应该有说说谁把谁先放掉。比如说某家公司做得很好，你可以 OK， 你去做并你可以做资本充足做。我觉得这个应该是一个一揽子的通告，一揽的通告中，我的个人判断是会说可能会说哪些是做得好的或者通过了。哪些还需要继续观察？可能还有些会会做的不好的被处罚，或者还有些会被他们去检查。有些可能验收呢，需要他们现场验收；有些呢，可能自己验收就 OK 了。所以在这个过程中，我个人觉得是让谁先结束？我觉得因为剩下的时间到今天看了，也就我个人觉得离一年的周期大概一个月的时间。我认为这些事情会慢慢明朗的。第三个就有关有会不会有新的一些呃有关助贷的这个。措施更严厉，措施出台。我认为，在过去的一两年中，整个对这个这个平台的监管，应该是从来没有这么严，也从来没有这么多政策立即出台。我个人判断，非常严厉的，非常让市场无法接受的，或者已经对非常脆弱的市场形成重大困扰的这种监管措施，我个人认为，呃，监管部门也是会是比较慎重的，更多是对过去的一系列监管政策的落地。或者有些在征求意见的过程中，把他把市场的所有参与者的呃建议吸收进去的一些落地和落地之后的执行效果的一些反思，而不是我认为还会尽快的呃又出去很多剧烈的政策。我我们从呃上面得到的消消息，得各种通道的消息应该是这样子的，因为我觉得现在政策已经足够，也足够宽度、广度、深度跟烈度。都已经够了，我就关注建设，他的要看到执行落地以及后续效果的观察。我我们大概一个判断是这样子的。如果有进步问题呢，我们也会及时跟你们沟通。May， thank you， May， please kindly， 我想我想我想 May， 哎 ，sorry to interrupt， please kindly repeat most of your questions in English， thank you。Oh， sorry。哦哦 ，OK OK。So one 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 Sorry, May.、Uh, shall I do a quick summary of the Q and A just just happened before we move on to the next? Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. So the question was yeah, on yeah, the、please. regulatory sense of the April 29th ratification and whether there's、uh, likely going to be more scrutiny or regulations coming for the loan facilitation model. That was the question.、Uh, so the chairman's answer was based on our overall judgment, obviously collecting information insights from a number of channels, including talking to various departments and talking to some of the other platforms in the 14 that's going through the review.、Uh, We are forming a view that it is number one. It is coming to an end. The process is coming to near the end of completion,、uh, given it, it is about a year long. And second, Lu Holdings is one of the better ones. We're not saying we're the best among the 14, but we're definitely one of the better ones. And that's based on our judgment again, hearing from multiple departments and talking to multiple people.、Uh, in terms of the end results, personally, I don't think there will be an exact ranking of the 14 platforms, but I won't be surprised to see. If you know they are grouping of different types of platforms, for example, there could be two types.、Uh, the first type is the ratification is almost complete, or if there is clear and acceptable plan for the ratification. And the second group, you know,、uh, there is not exactly、uh, acceptable plans to complete the ratification.、Uh, in terms of timing, look, we've been saying to the regulators, loving heart, given it is coming to the one-year anniversary,、uh, we do think we need this to conclude and. I'm pleased to say that I think people at the TDOC and the CDIRC and CSRC they do hear our views and they do agree with us that they want to bring this to a con conclusion.、Um, in terms of what we've done in the past two years, I think、uh, through this process,、uh, very importantly, we've kind of rebuilt our trust with the regulators. And through the process, obviously, we have redesigned a lot of our business models to be more compliant.、Um, In terms of the、uh, new regulations on loan facilitation,、uh, based on my communication and personal understanding. We think the regulations is already enough. The focus is more on the actual implementation of those regulations,、uh, including some that are still going through consultation. And the regulators would like to see the outcome of the early implementation rather than throwing out new ones. May go ahead with your other two questions, please. Um, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. 呃，如果我可以再 follow up， 记者我想问一下，就是说刚才您说会是一揽子的，可能宣布有些公司做得好，一些公司都不好，他是需要等那个做得不好的也都整改完，才能够再给一个，比如说批准，说你们去开始做港股的 I P 这个这个 I P O 啊，或者说是 secondary 的二次上市啊
，就是这个上市的时间点，呃，会不会受到这个影响？就是这是一个 follow up， 这个是一个 follow up 的问题。那我先问一下其他那两个问题，比较小一点的问题。呃、uh, ，Sorry, the my question so long. Um, okay, the other two questions I have. Um, one is、uh, still regarding the business channel transformation. Um, that you mentioned the direct sales channel would have better asset quality. Um, the, I, I think、uh, Greg, you mentioned that the、uh, M3 flow ratio has、um, deteriorated a bit in the fourth quarter as you increase the uh, the the uh, business sources from direct channel. So is that mainly because of the、um, the macro、uh, environment changes that some retail、um, uh, loans are having some deterioration in asset quality, or or is it、uh, also because of、uh, some other reasons that、uh, maybe the life insurance side?、Uh, Uh, business has deteriorated a lot more. And second,、uh, sort of small question is about the、uh, take rate on the wealth management. You mentioned that the、um, uh, take rate has gone up.、Uh, what kind of product was mainly、uh, driving that? And also going into the future,、uh, how the take rate improve uh, uh, further? Thank you.、Uh, okay, the second question about the asset quality situation in the fourth quarter. Yeah, we confirm. Yeah, it's mainly because of the impact from live channel. Uh, if you exclude live channel and only、uh, only see the performance of the other channels, especially direct sales channels, then it's quite stable. A、uh, little bit impact、uh, in December, January because of uh, the uh, lockdown of Harbin and Xi'an, where we have two creation centers. So that made minor impacts on our creation performance.、Uh, but mostly,、uh, the majority of, of the majority of impact came from the live channel situation, and that's why、uh, we made a rapid adjustment to channel mix. Um, maybe may I take your question on wealth before going back to, to Chairman G. On wealth, basically, what we did through the course of 2021、um, is we let lower、uh, margin products kind of run off、um, and replace them more、uh, with more focus on qualified investor products,、um, and also uh, gradually uh, the fund mix is also changing to within mutual funds to higher margin products, and then we're also adding insurance services which are higher margin.、Uh, so all of those together. Um, as well as some of our、uh, services to、uh, third-party platforms, fees that we collect, providing our technology to other financial institutions, have been growing as well. So if you take those in, in accumulation,、uh, we see the number of I think it's 69、uh, basis points、uh, in the fourth quarter, which was up a lot、uh, year on year. I, I, I expect、uh, in 2022 we'll continue to see uh, improvement uh, on this、uh, revenue over AUM.、Um, you know, adding another 10 basis points. Over the course of the year,、uh, is probably a realistic expectation. 好，哎，我继续呃，试图来回答你刚才的问题啊。这个问题确实是很尖锐的。呃，我我个人判断，我反过来讲，是我个人判断。我觉得，呃，这个十四家、十三家这四十家公司，总体来讲，我会，我个人认为会一次性的告诉大家。大家各家完成怎么样，而不会是说，呃，今天告诉说这家完成 OK 了，放掉了，明天继续说还有三家放掉，还有十还有十加一，他们再去跟着来。我个人认为会有个阶段性的，我个人认为啊，一再说我的个人判断会有个阶段性的一次性的，啊、呃，这个一个一个一个表态。我觉得可能哪些是 OK 了，可以继续往前走了。有有些人可能还要持续跟踪，就是还有一些东西你要持续提供。整改方案，我估计是这样一个一个，就这十四十三加一，应该是这样的情况。呃，我个人呃估计呢，时间不会太久。我觉得呃，我们可能会等着一个等一个监管部门一个正式表态吧。我们现在最主要是把我们自己事情做好。到目前为止呢，我们我们还有一些需要持续整改的。所以持续整改就是我认为我们的方案是得到认可，但是需要时间，对吧？我们刚才说了，包括我的那些子孙公司的清理，包括我的存量的这互联网存款的事情，好，还有断直连的有些现在政策还不明朗。刚才 Y 是讲了，呃，这个，所以说是这个事情。四二九的平台的整改会不会影响到我的回到香港？呃，我个人认为一定会影响。我个人我认为一定会影响。哦、呃，至少对我们这样的公司，我认为是影响。对别人有没有影响，我不大清楚。我个人觉得，将来我们回香港的问题上面，我觉得包括四二九这个平台的清理，以及证监会、人民银行、银保监会、网信办，我个人认为他们都应该会发表意见。我个人认为，而且我想向大家报告，我们其实也是都有接触。我想这个是一定要在符合监管要求、符合国家总体政策的情况下，我们才会回到香港去。而且这个事情，我觉得我们也不会去贸然去做市场尝试的这种动作，或者或者说是在跟监管不打招呼的情况下去做任何动作。这是一个，还有就是我个人认为，目前中国跟美国的整个，我觉得整个的接触还是一直存在的，而且也要相信。两国监管部门就是他们的智慧。
我觉得这个整个因为中概股在美国的体量很大，影响非常大。我认为最后大家会想到一个妥协的办法或者一个合适的办法。我我们也当然希望这个办法，这些妥协方案尽快出来。谢谢您。Again, a quick summary of the Q&A just happened. The question was on、uh, the exact timing of the April 29th conclusion announcement and whether that would impact、uh, the Lufthansa Hong Kong listing.、Um, the answer is, I think the chairman personally, and he stresses many times that it's his personal judgment,、uh, that the announcement will likely be made in one go instead of separate announcement for each of the platforms.、Uh, and on that announcement, there's likely going to be. That obviously there's one group that the ratification is almost done, or the plan is acceptable, so they're okay to move on to other things. And the remaining whose plans are not acceptable will require continued monitoring and scrutiny from the regulators. So he believes will be one announcement. And personally, he does not think that's going to be too long.、Uh, but of course, the exact timing、uh, will need to wait for regulatory formal announcement. It is for formal announcement.、Uh, on, in terms of Hong Kong listing,、uh, yes, the April 29th ratification. Will impact the timing of the Hong Kong listing.、Uh, before we complete that, we will not go to Hong Kong.、Uh, we have made preliminary discussions with TDOC, CSRC, CBRC, and the China Cyber Security Watchdog.、Uh, so obviously, Lufax will not pursue a Hong Kong IPO until we get blessing from those relevant regulators. And the last point on the China-U.S. relationship:、uh, through our channels, we believe the regulators from both sides are having continued dialogues. We trust in their wisdom, as you know, the impact. Of a forced delisting of the Chinese ADRs will be too big for both sides to take.、Uh, so we think they are currently working very hard, and we hope a conclusion or some sort of plan or, or compromise will be reached soon. Thank you, operator. I think that concludes our call today. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's call. Thank you for joining. You may now disconnect your line.